Call the City Council work session order. Clerk, please call the roll. Vining? Here. Germani? Here. Lamore? Present. Felder? Here. Whitman? Here. Echoangeli? Present. Mayor Clark? Here. We have uh, three items that I see on the work session and maybe others, but I'll just get right to Mr. Pastu because uh, we have some presentations this evening. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, we've got a uh, couple of uh, projects that the uh, Director of uh, Water and Wastewater Utilities, uh, Barry uh, Leroy, has been working with with some of the uh, townships where we provide uh, service. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is Exit Township <coughs> and, and try and uh, make the improvements and closing uh, and, uh, dead end loops uh, there at, uh, that ends uh, with the distribution system in Exeter. And then the next item would be uh, London Township's uh, request for expanding their distribution uh, system. So first, uh, we'll start with Exeter Township. Uh, Barry? Sure. Mayor and Council. Um, thanks for having me tonight. Um, First one is uh, Exeter Township. It's called the Raisin Street Water Main Loop. Got the mic on. Oh, yeah. We're good. Tilt it up a little more, maybe. Stretch up. Back a little more. This way. This way. Up. That way. Your voice going down. We'll pick it up. There you go. Better. Thank you. All right. Everybody here? We're good. Excellent. Okay. Um, there it is. So the this Exeter uh, Township Raisin Street Water Main Loop. Um, we have a, a significant amount of dead ends in our water system, um, and uh, we were approached by Exeter Township to consider closing some of the loops with a, a different mechanism that we have built into our water agreement. Um, I wanted to touch base on a few of the provisions, and then I'll get into the locations geographically and uh, some other areas, uh, other areas to discuss. Um, we first started providing water service to Exeter Township in 1997 when uh, the Village of Baby came on board. Um, their original water agreement uh, was redone in 1999, and that's kind of their base agreement. Um, the area, uh, the service areas can be established by Exeter Township Board, um, and as far as the funding for those projects, those are done through special assessments or uh, other means. It, there's a provision in our water agreement that will allow us to help contribute to projects to help enlarge in our system and resolve issues. Uh, we have completed some loops in the past in their township as well to help uh, mitigate flushing issues, uh, having to flush water out to maintain water quality. Um, in 2007, we signed a first amendment to extend the water agreement in Exeter Township um, and uh, to, through 2035. And there was a few provisions put in there. One was called the uh, buy-in cost capacity, where uh, uh, we provided them more water capacity and uh, through special assessment districts, the system development fee that's collected for each parcel that's not been previously serviced, uh, it helps offset that buying capacity. It pays it down. Um, that cost has been paid back, and um, it uh, continues to grow, uh, if you want to think of it that way, as a surplus. So we've been tracking that, and through last fiscal year, it's over $213,000. Um, and we take that money and put it right back into capital improvements. Uh, we've been very aggressive with that. Um, so the request from Exeter Township is to uh, help close some of those dead ends. That's the last bullet here on this first slide. Uh, to help loose, uh, loop uh, a couple of dead ends uh, that connect uh, in Exeter Township using some of the surplus uh, system development fee uh, from those past uh, special assessment districts. And uh, any, off any additional costs would be surcharged back to their customers, and I'll explain how that would work. That would be for like a 10-year period max. Um, this first slide is uh, the existing water system. And uh, you can see where Exeter Township is. Uh, it's kind of northwest of the city of Monroe. It's about 36 square miles minus uh, the area of the village of Maybe. This next slide is uh, the blue lines represent 12-inch water main. And the kind of the purplish magenta is 8-inch. And those red dots that are shown, those are, cons those are dead ends that we have to flush. Um, we have 15, de uh, 15 auto flushers. Those run every day um, between 20 and 30 minutes a day, and they run about 150 gallons a minute. So there's, there's quite, a, quite a lot of water flushing that goes on to maintain water quality for, for our customers. Um, we also have five dead end mains that we actually flush manually each month. Um, this next slide is uh, kind of showing uh, that the yellow are our, uh, from our asset management plan that we have built in. 
that would close dead ends. Um, so we have built out and think of the 2057 in our capital improvement plans using uh, funding that we have projected. And uh, these loops, these would help loop dead end mains to help minimize flushing and operating costs. Um, and uh, those, those dashed ones are interconnections, potential interconnections with London Township, which I'll talk about in the next presentation. Um, and so, uh, go back to the slide. So by the village of Maybe there in the bottom left-hand corner, there's where Raisin Street is. And this is a blow-up of that area, showing the Raisin Street loop, which uh, would connect between two auto flushers. Um, that is, I guess, what you would consider a jurisdictional line, where you have one jurisdiction on one side and the other on. The village of Maybe is on the east side, and Exeter Township's on the west side. Um, so this Raisin Street loop would eliminate two dead ends, which meets... Uh, <laughs> meets our goals and objectives. Um, and it uh, would help contribute to us uh, reducing our unaccounted for water, which is our flushing operation that we have to maintain uh, water quality system. Uh, also meets our requirement of uh, closing a loop that we have outlined in our asset management plan. Um, and I wanted to point out that we, we have given credit in the past through uh, various water agreements from Obligations. Example of that from 2007, uh, the 2007 agreement is um, in exchange for reducing or eliminating uh, water main oversize costs. Uh, that's a provision in most water agreements we have where uh, we pay like a 40% uh, of water sales back to uh, a township jurisdiction uh, based on water sales for uh, oversizing a main so we can provide water um, to other townships. Uh, we eliminate that from their water agreement in exchange for uh, paying that up front as a present value and uh, reducing some of the buy-in cost from uh, 2007. So uh, we also have other uh, provisions that are examples that we have done that. Um, but I wanted to at least point that out. As far as uh, how this would, this is a proposal. Um, so uh, how to fund this project, um, we tallied up the, all the construction costs, engineering, and design. And us added some contingency. It's about 457000 is the project cost. The uh, system development fee uh, surplus would reduce that cost by about 213000 We would give a flushing credit back, about $68,000. That's over the depreciation life of that main that would go in. Um, Exeter Township has mentioned they have about $26,000 in cash that they would provide towards the project. <coughs> And then the balance would be through a surcharge that would get paid back to the city uh, water fund over a maximum of 10 year period. Um, here's some information on the surcharge, how we envisioned and how it might work. Um, we there's currently over 600 customers in uh, Exeter Township that are connected, um, and that continues to grow. We're proposing about a $10 bit per bill uh, surcharge that would get collected from all customers, so about $40 a year. That would generate about $25,000 a year back to the water fund. Um, and then we would annually adjust uh, any, any new customers that tap in and use their system development fees to help reduce that balance. Uh, with those two uh, criteria, we would estimate about no more than six years that it would pay it back, um, pay the cost back to the city water fund. Um, the water fund would front the money as far as the cost to fund this project. And uh, we would incorporate the project. We'd pull it forward from 2052 uh, to more of a, build it into our capital improvement plan on a sooner time frame. Um, and one of the conditions that uh, in talking with Exeter Township, uh, uh, the supervisor, uh, they created a uh, non-districted um, assessment uh, that would be collected through um, customers tying in for, uh, for areas that don't have a current special assessment. Uh, those costs that are, or those, uh, rev that revenue that's collected would be utilized to help offset um, future water needs and uh, could be used for this project as well. Uh, when a district gets paid off, uh, they, can't, they don't charge an assessment, so they would collect uh, a fee um, as a representative cost of the, the past district so they can help offset their, their water needs. Uh, they've already passed that ordinance and um, 
not sure exactly when the enforcement date starts, but it, anyway, they've, they've created that part. As far as a schedule, um, I'm presenting this tonight to City Council. Um, I'll be uh, going over this with Exeter Township um, here this month as well. Uh, the next step would be developing a letter of understanding um, with uh, between both units of government. And then likely, uh, if, if it's a still a go and moving forward, we would present at the City Council um, in Exeter Township in November. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Water Department would then schedule funding um, in accordance with their capital improvement plan to start the design, survey, and construction and inspection. So that's kind of a quick summary. Um, is there any questions on the logistics of this type of project? I, I might, but I'll see if I, well, John and I'll see <laughs> Andrew. <coughs> Can you cycle back to the, uh, <coughs> on the uh, six year surcharge payoff? Yes. If I understand you correctly, the water fund is going to advance the money as part of the project, and then it will be paid off over a six year period. Yes, uh, the balance, the balance, balance. funds do it. Okay, is, it, and is that going to be, is that, is there an imputed interest rate on that? That hasn't been discussed at this point where this is very preliminary. Okay. Okay. Because um, I'm thinking that, you know, the cost of money is, you know, what we borrow, what we use today is going to be less with inflation, so. True. Uh, and then, if I understand you correctly, based on this non-district assessment area, is that the same thing as a tap-in fee, that if someone wants to tap into the system, they're going to pay up front? Right. Uh, currently, currently, if uh, somebody wants to apply for water, they would have to pay their, <coughs> an assessment cost uh, in these districted areas. For customers, if they split their property and then now they want to tap in and it's, there's no district that exists, they would then pay that fee to Exeter Township that they, they could then use for their water needs for whether it's doing a master plan study or uh, applying it towards this. So that's a fee that is not... That would not be a city fee. It's not a city fee. The, the township actually chart assesses its own fee. They would then assess the customer that's applying, yes. Okay. Andrew, uh, did you have a question? Or? Yes, sir. Um, uh, so Exeter is coming to us re requesting this... To, to reduce the, the flushing requirements of the system, or is this something that we want to implement on the system to, to improve efficiency? It's actually both. Uh, okay. we, we have them outlined, and uh, they've approached us about closing some of the loops, and uh, we have it, that particular location is actually on our schedule, um, and even though it's in the future, but there's quite a cost to just maintain water quality out there for doing that. So, yeah, so it's kind of a... They approached us, but uh, we definitely have a need as well. Brian? I see that you have some dead ends remaining uh, on that map. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Yes, well, we still have some dead ends, yes. Okay. you know how many approximately you'd have left over? Well, there's uh, currently 15 auto flushers. So um, there's a, I mean, we, we just go back and count the number of tier. I see three for sure, and then they'd have. You said there's the other three would be going connecting to London Township. Right. Yeah. There's a possible tie off. An additional thirteen total. I see four. I see four. Okay. Yeah, the three going to the exit are looped back into Raisinville Township. That I'll show you in a few minutes here. Is it is it a benefit to basically loop them all, or um, some locations just don't make cost effective sense to do. Uh, okay. Just based on the the length and the, you know if they're a de if they're a dead end and there's no uh, available way to loop a main back to another main um, that's that that that's it as a struggle. Um, I mean, like subdivisions, for example, if you have a mm -hmm. dead end cul de sac and it's a mile off the road, you really doesn't make a lot of sense to bring another mile back to loop it. But I, mean, I guess that's uh that's to be determined if there's an opportunity there. Okay. So a question, uh, Barry, just for, I guess, awareness and everybody, the, the lines that are currently there, the, the time frame you gave as far as when they were put in and how that got paid, but uh, ownership and then maintenance, and then, of course, uh, if we're adding lines, what's the long-term, I guess, sustainability of costs that might be related? Who's, who's responsible and how does it get done? 
As far as the mains, uh, currently the, sis the city um, operates the mains. Um, in our water agreements, uh, when bonds are uh, still existing, they technically are still owned by, uh, in this case, would be the Monroe County Drain Commissioner. Um, we have historically had an, um, an agreement to operate the mains um, for them. They do not become an asset of the city until the bonds are paid off. Then there's a, a transfer that automatically happens, and then we book those as an asset. So I guess looking long term, when they transfer from through the bonds and uh, maintenance at that point, then they shift to the city's responsibility. What's the, uh, I'll just say the uh, sustainability and the cost for that? How does that get set aside, whether it be in a project like this or others? Because I know we have lines that go elsewhere in the county. How do we make sure that down the road that other people sitting up here years from now say, well, how are we going to pay for that? Um, that's built into our rate model. Okay. Um, so those, those assets are then booked. Um, as an asset, and then uh, we build that value into our system, and uh, capital improvements are then built around that to uh, make sure they're sustainable. Okay, so we'll make sure we everybody has that too. So, see if there's other questions on this one. I don't see any, so I know you have a, uh, another one. Yep. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> Barry, just real quick, how, how big is that main that you're building on Raisin Street? Um, that would just be an eight-inch loop. No, how, what's the length? Oh, I'm sorry. It's about 2,900 feet. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, there's a few existing customers that are, or a few existing residents of Exeter Township that want to tap into that as soon as it's available, too. So um, it would help generate additional customers. Get out. You're talking about a million dollars per mile for a water main. <coughs> uh, a little bit less. Yeah. I mean, we're expecting, this is green space, so we're expecting to get a lower cost, okay. hopefully. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> this year's been an okay. example. So, okay. As you get, uh, before you started, Barry, I want to make sure, uh, uh, Mr. Pastu, if there's anything further on that. No, just, okay. uh, I think, just to get council aware that uh, this project is uh, mm -hmm. being discussed and, you know, more details, obviously, if we find our way into the letter of understanding, so. Okay. Barry, next one. <clears throat> Uh, next up is uh, we have a water system expansion uh, proposal in London Township that uh, we've been working on for several months, actually since the spring. Um, I'll touch base real quick on some of these water agreement provisions as well. Um, we have uh, been serving London Township, which is actually just next to uh, Exeter Township since 1997. <coughs> and uh, the original agreement um, was signed in 1997. Uh, it expired in 2017, and we renewed that with uh, the first amendment um, to water agreement in uh, January of 17. The uh, uh, original agreement is, was very similar to Exeter Townships, had a lot of the same provisions, um, except it was uh, only retail service in the southeast corner of the township, the uh, southeast one mile, one square mile. Um, the first amendment, uh, in 2017 established the maximum gallon per day of uh, 18,000 and uh, it extended the agreement till 2050. Um, it also eliminated the oversized water line reimbursement provision and uh, it established a lot of the same characteristics of the Exeter Township which has a large user large water user agreement which is a, a user with a meter that's larger than one inch and it also established the capacity for buying cost. <clears throat> Um, as a London Township is uh, desiring to expand their system about 75 miles, uh, there'll be uh, other potential improvements that are still being vetted. Um, but it, they're only interested in water retail service uh, for the residents, and it's virtually through the entire township. Um, London Township is uh, immediately west of Exeter Township. Um, it's a, as I mentioned, the southeast corner of the township is currently under a retail service area. The, uh, the blow up on the right is really the only area that's currently served. It's a, a small subdivision, about 76 connections, and it has a total footage of about 5,700 feet. Uh, this uh, map here is uh, from, a, from their consultant that I've been working with, and they're looking at, um, it's kind of hard to read, but it's about 75 miles. Um, it's about four phases is what they're proposing to do it in. The uh, green 
uh, hatched area, those parcels, those are that would be phase one. And phase two would be on the, the yellow, and it's south and kind of in the middle. Uh, then they would go in the northwest area, phase three, and then the blue would be phase four. Um, there's a, about just under 1,800 total parcels in the township. This project affects about 1,461 parcels. And uh, over 1,100 have a structure, which uh, is still being determined uh, what type of structure. Um, some, some, some uh, excuse me, the uh, important thing to note here, it's about 2,700 people would be the population that would be increased to our um, people served in our um, water system. They're looking at a two-year phased construction project um, overall. <clears throat> And here's just a few bullet items that we're working on from an evaluation standpoint. Um, we're looking at, uh, we, we did a few studies. Uh, one study is a retail versus wholesale type evaluation. As I mentioned, uh, they're, they're only interested in a retail type solution, which is us being responsible for the mains and being responsible for, for the service lines up to the meter, water quality, things like that. Um, the wholesale option would be very similar to how we service Petersburg and Dundee, which is basically we have a master meter and service, uh, provide them water and certain quality requirements and pressure and flow and things of that nature. Um, that's in the preliminary stage, stages. It's being uh, reviewed currently by city administration. Um, the second study we're looking at is uh, a follow-up to our 2008 South Custer Booster Station feasibility study. What we wanted to evaluate there is um, we have done some improvements in that um, those recommendations, and we've uh, with adding London on it. What does that do? do? Do we have to add to it? So we're evaluating that to make sure uh, system improvements are done appropriately, where it's going to benefit our responsibilities and benefit the customers through the whole service area. Versus, um, you know, if, a, if an elevated tank has to be added, is it strictly just for London Township, or does it benefit everybody? So we're we're vetting those right now in that study. Um, this evaluation, this would require a, an estimated at this point, about 240,000 gallon per day from 18,000. Um, there is a few large users out there uh, that we're estimating. There would be, uh, I think Milan Dragway is one, and um, there's a campground. There may be others that I'm not aware of right now. Um, as far as buy-in capacity cost, um, we're estimating about, about 1,057 REUs at this point. Um, and so that buying cost, based on our uh, methodology that we've used in the past, is be a little over $2 million that would be due. Um, and that we've been it's been requested for a discount at this point. Um, and the reason for that is um, London Township is looking at um, holistically tying all costs into one bond. And that includes services and everything, and I'll explain more about that here in a minute. Um, so it's a time value of money. So if, instead of uh, it taking 15 to 20 years to get the number of customers to tie in, um, you would get them in within two. So there's there's a, a potential savings there because of the interest we would be discussed. Anyway, this we can discuss more of that in the future, but um, it's been requested at this point. Uh, another thing that would need to occur based on the timeline of the bond would be extending the water agreement. That would we would need to extend that at least another 10 years just to make sure that the bonds get paid off uh, within the time frame of the agreement. <clears throat> as far as water services, um, currently the traditional way we've done it, um, a special assessment district happens, the mains get extended, tested, put in service, and then customers start applying for service. In this case, um, in an effort to try to holistically tie all uh, cost into one bond. It's been requested to install the services with the project, um, and then we would have a provision for how customers actually tie in through application. Uh, that would uh, that, that way a, a customer would have just one cost. They wouldn't have to pay their assessment and then come up with another three to five thousand dollars to then connect to the system. Um, so, in an effort to accommodate that, we would then have to have our water department staff inspecting, verifying materials, um, documenting, making tap cards, things of that nature, to make because we're perpetually responsible for that service after it gets installed. 
Um, just some historical information. Within 10 years, we typically get about 80% of the special assessments tying in. We would get that within two years, likely, so or more. Um, I mentioned uh, the population increase to our, uh, our water system. Now, currently, we're serving over 48,000 people. Um, if you add 2,700 to that, that catapults you over 50,000. There's some significance to that because there's uh, several provisions that uh, will then require us as a system to take on uh, additional testing requirements, uh, regulatory requirements. I mean, just it's, it's in, like the new lead and copper law. I mean, there's a new provision. We'd have to establish a new council just for that um, to uh, administer that part of it. I mean, there's, there's significant improvements, which could cost uh, additional operating costs, which um, at this point, we've re put a request into the Department of, now it's called Eagle, uh, the state of Michigan, to give us a comprehensive list uh, on what those provisions would be so we can build that in. Um, as far as system improvements, I mentioned uh, we studied the South Coast of Brewster Station feasibility study, updating that. Uh, we definitely would need to expand those pumps, uh, and I'll give you the schedule for that. And I did mention uh, there, there may be additional uh, improvements that may need to be addressed. An elevated tank, um, a booster station possibly. Uh, we may have to raise our maybe tank instead, but uh, we're still, again, vetting those final solutions. Um, as far as responsibilities, <clears throat> we've already talked about some of these, but capacity evaluation, uh, we got to make sure that uh, we're taking that into account for the whole system. Uh, that's through the South Custer Booster Station system improvements. Uh, testing and sampling and all the re regulatory requirements that go along with expanding 75 miles. Um, typically, we're seeing system, uh, system expansion about five miles at a time in an assessment. Uh, this is 75 miles, so there's quite a task in doing that over a two-year period. Uh, we would have to develop a letter of understanding, similar to what we did with, would have to do with Exeter Township. Our staff uh, will have to go through all the inspections for the services, as well as all the water main testing and design review time and permitting. Um, the, we'll have to administer a, a service connection protocol for how customers tie in to make sure it's fair and equitable and um, will meet everybody's needs. And then maintaining and operating the system, that's the key. Um, flow pressure and flushing. Um, we are performing water age analysis to make sure water quality will uh, not be a problem uh, with the system that's being built, trying to minimize as many dead ends as possible. As far as funding, uh, the estimated cost, uh, according to their consultants, is about $37 million for this expansion. They're currently looking at uh, USDA drinking water revolving fund and just capital improvement bonds. 30-year um, bonds have been discussed. And uh, as I mentioned, they're holistically looking at tying all costs into one bond payment um, for this project. So as far as schedule, um, they're currently working on loan application and bonding options right now. Um, I don't believe any decisions have been final, but they're, they're vetting them. <clears throat> if this was a go, it would be looking at 2020 and 21 for design and survey and engineering. Um, construction would be a two-year project, 20, 2021 through 23. We would have to complete our projects by 2023 to accommodate serving them. Um, and as far as sampling and services, uh, that, that would occur during the same time during construction. That is what I have on this update. Is there any questions with regard to this project at this point? Questions from council? <coughs> yes. Oh, well, Michelle, and then I'll come Michelle, this way. Go ahead. Michelle. So it, took, it seems to me like we're, we're going to have a lot of cost up front, and it's going to take us 30 years to recoup it in the bond. Am I seeing that correctly? It would be paid for uh, by the township residents that are, that are in the district. Uh, the only cost we would have would be system improvements. Um, our South Custer Booster Station expansion, which we already have programmed, um, if there's uh, any project cost, free, well, that would have to be done um, by 2023 before they go online. 
So that would be included in your future budget? Right. That's already in our capital improvements. It just, uh, we may need to accelerate it a little bit. All right. Thank you. Thanks. John? <coughs> Barry, is, is, the, is the township currently experiencing groundwater, wa water quality issues? I'm going to, most, uh, the, the, the information I've gathered, um, most of it is uh, holding tanks. Um, I'm sure there are groundwater problems. Um, I don't know the extent completely of that. Um, there are, uh, there's some representatives here that, uh, from London Township that may be able to speak to that specifically. Um, I don't have the depth of that, uh, but I, obviously they, uh, potable water, water is, uh, from a reliable source is desired in the township. Okay. An another question I have, and it's, mm -hmm. it's primarily, I don't think it's directed towards the project as it is towards maybe the representatives from London Township. Putting in 75 miles worth of water main in the township is going to completely change the complexity of development opportunities in the township. So it's going to go from basically agricultural, rural, rural estate. It's going to, you're putting water mains in, there's going to be a lot of new development. I guess the question for London Township is, uh, how much of the property, Barry showed a map, there's a lot of large parcels. How many prime agricultural properties are going to be affected by putting in water main now? Break off, for example, one acre lots. That's not happened with the zoning ordinances that we have. That's actually a, um, a concern. Yeah, yeah. A you probably should, come, you probably should come forward, I guess. Just come forward and just, that's okay. Just well, there's a question. And I think it's a good, it's a start question. And maybe we're going to compile some questions that we'll yeah. forward yeah. back. And that way you have some of the items. And maybe we'll just start with a response to this. And maybe we'll just start collecting some of these inquiries for later. But Absolutely. just so you're who you are, and then that way we can All go right. forward. My name is Barb O'Neill. I'm a resident in London Township. I'm actually in charge of the Water Committee. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for providing us an opportunity to obtain clean water for our residents. Um, to answer your question about the quality, yeah, the majority of the wells are horrific. The sulfur is so bad um, that appliances are rotting away, electrical systems are rotting, rotting away. Women have to keep their jewelry in plastic bags. People are afraid to feed it to their children. So yes, it's an ongoing problem. Um, and those of us who have converted to tanks are experiencing um, substantial difficulty obtaining water. We've had a major water supplier retire, actually a couple of them in the last couple of years, but one major one just retired. Um, we have elderly um, individuals who are unable, obviously, and I, I'm one of the people, I to drive a truck with a tank on it and get my own water, so the costs are accelerating. I'll, I'll wait, it's outrageous. Um, so, as far as the farmland question, we do. We have a lot of farmers, and they are analyzing the situation very carefully. We're doing a lot of investigation to understand how to handle people who want to divide their property in the future. Um, there's a lot of residents who said, you know, I moved here to be in the country. You know, I don't want a bunch of development, so we're being very careful and making sure that they understand that our zoning regulations are pretty strict. So there's really not going to be a bunch of one-acre parcels popping up, you know, with houses on them. The zoning regulations just don't provide for it. Your Honor, I just want, uh, do you know who your planning consultant is? Our engineers? No, your con planning consultant. You have a planning consultant firm that does your master plan? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I am working with the chair for the planning Barry. commission. Well, Barry, you know? That. Barry, we have it. No, I, I don't know the consultant, but I did ask that specific question. When our some of our prior meetings, you know, I just I'll just give you I'll just give you an observation. Okay. If you take a look at uh, if you go on Google and take a look down in Ohio at Perrysburg Township, uh, years ago they put in a water system through their agricultural area, and what people did was in order to max in order to get clean water, they started dividing their parcels up into one and five acre sites. They probably had some of the best prime agricultural land in Northwest Ohio. 
they ended up with a lot of derelict property that's unusable because the farmers can't farm it anymore because it's too chopped up. Uh, so I guess the op what, I'm, what I'm getting at is when you do a development of this size, 75 miles of water main, mm -hmm. you better, before you even implement it, you better have a really good idea of how you're going to allow people to divide their property to benefit from the water without really constricting or endangering the prime agricultural lands. You can't do it after the fact because it, it, it just doesn't work. You have to do it as a public policy going into this. Because this is, this is significant, Very good point. Seven, 75 miles of water. It's gonna change the complexity of the township. Yeah. And the chair of the planning commission is, is directly involved. So okay. I will definitely take that back yeah. you know, to him. We take a look at that. Uh, and I know that our ordinances are different by zoned area, but five acres is the minimum, yeah. Okay. So. I, I guess follow up that I think about as you're getting support and buying from the residents, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that up front, it doesn't allow some to sit back and say, well, this will be an opportunity in the sense in which John is referring to, so it prevents that. That way those that are gonna be kind of uh, supporting and funding uh, through your bonds know that there's not that avenue, so to speak, if you're trying to maintain that agricultural, and yet, as you said, it appears, as, as you said, the, you know, from the water committee, obviously, you know, having clean potable water, water, but also the challenge with uh, getting it delivered and tanks, uh, knowing if those are your priorities and still kind of maintain what it is of your, I'll just say your culture of your, or of your township, uh, that you're looking for, that there's not those that are thinking it'd be something different. So I agree with John that up front is it's critical the message that's delivered to those that uh, if, if this comes about in a long sense, it's a very big project and maybe it was, uh, you know, look at two different projects here and the difference of what might be asked, but uh, understand it. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I'd be happy to take any questions that come no, I th I th yeah. You know, just another comment. I think, you know, the, to the township approaching it from, a, like Barry said, a holistic approach mm -hmm. and in trying to really take a look at what the system could be and the problems it could resolve mm -hmm. is a really good thing. But I just think on the flip side, you need to analyze once that goes in, what are the other impacts and how you're going to manage that mm -hmm. ahead of time. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Very you're welcome. Much. Sure. There may be other questions that come up from council and, and or administration along the lines. We'll make sure we're at center one at a time. We'll kind of think about that as Barry uh, goes through the uh, analysis as well. But uh, is there any other con uh, questions for uh, Mr. Leroy? Uh, yes, Andrew. I have two. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, would the contracts go through uh, the water department itself? Does the township pay you guys, or is the township going to vote on those contracts? They can apply by themselves as a township, um, but they would likely uh, go through like the drain commissioner's office. They have, okay. The county has a great bond rating. Uh, they would likely take a bond out through them, but uh, they're currently vetting that with, uh, I think, PFM in Ann Arbor right now. Mm -hmm. So that for us, this is a capacity and regulatory issue. Right. And the increased costs that we will incur by putting us in that next regulatory category will be covered by the new customers that we have to receive. I'm not trying to make, you know, I'm saying this in, in full view of, the, of our friends here and neighbors in, in London Township. I'm not trying to make money off of them, but I don't want it to cost us either. Right. That's what that retail versus wholesale option. We okay. evaluated that to make sure um, historically we have uh, any customer served outside the city, it's a factor of two times what city rate payers are. We're evaluating that to make sure that's applicable um, hmm. and making sure it's covering the cost. Okay. Barry, just for, for <coughs> just educational purposes, an REU is a residential equivalent unit. Correct. Okay. And then the other part is, when you do wholesale like Dundee and Petersburg, basically they own their system and they bill their customers. Correct. If it's retail on our end, eventually the system becomes part of our asset once the bonds are paid off. We do the maintenance and we also do the billing? Yes, we would do the billing as okay. well. Yes, they would be our retail customers. They'd be our retail customers. Correct. Okay. 
Andrew. Wonderful question. In terms of the county, I think you had a map up earlier of, of Monroe's water system. And I know that we have uh, two wholesale customers, uh, Petersburg and Dundee. Um, but it looks like after this project, we'll have all of London, all of e uh, Exeter, um, uh, Raisinville. Uh, we have a joint operation with Frenchtown Township and then, of course, Monroe Township in the city. Correct. So we're so essentially servicing almost half the county at this point. Our with service Monroe area water. currently is 117 square miles, so it'd be another 36. It's a job well done. I hope this project, you know, it's, it's a huge project. It'll be an investment in the community. That's a lot of money. Other questions for Barry? Very well. Barry, thank you. I'm sure that as we uh, think this through and as you make other inquiries with the council, there may be some additional uh, questions and we'll make sure they get forward and look forward to having the dialogue further your honor yes john is it appropriate that we at least indicate to both exeter and london township officials that the city is in favor of proceeding with both projects <coughs> well if i That's, may just give yeah, a quick qualifier let us uh, finish uh, the uh, the re the retail wholesale well, review what i'm getting at is at this oh, point concept, at, yeah. at this in concept at this point we're not yeah right. Yeah, Clearly, the, the the Exeter I think is is a win win for both parties, uh, and, and in London, you know, they obviously have water quality issues, and so it's just a matter of looking at the details and the cost associated with that, and, and those type of issues. So, but I think conceptually, we're all on board with it. Very good. Very good. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. And thank you for being here as well, um, Mr. Pastu. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Next item we want to talk a little bit about is the St. Mary's Garden uh, infrastructure project. Uh, and in the past, it's been pretty much storm sewer. Uh, it's still going to be dominantly uh, this, as we've talked about it last fall, actually. But I did, uh, on a couple of occasions recently, talk about the need for us to consider some footing drain disconnects in that area, which are a significant contributor to the, to the um, sanitary sewer system and, and some of the capacity issues that we have, uh, as well as our... Uh, uh, not a consent agreement, but uh, remedial action plan that we have to, to consider. So I'm going to let Patrick walk through it, and then we'll talk a little bit more on the back end about the uh, uh, sanitary sewer disconnect. So, Okay. Patrick. I'm Council Patrick Lewis, Director of Engineering and Public Services. I'll st start this off. I'll read a little bit from the slides, and I apologize. The maps aren't real easy to read here, but I'll do my best to... Uh, to highlight this. I know we don't really have a clicker that will highlight it, but some of this you've already seen. We did a, pr a brief presentation on this back in the fall as we were uh, discussing this kind of with some future CIP opportunities. But um, we, are, we do have a proposal in hand from the Spicer Group for the initial phases of design. So we wanted to uh, introduce this in hopes of potentially getting that on the actual agenda for two weeks from now. Uh, as you're well aware, we're calling this the St. Mary's Garden subdivision. There's different phases. Uh, n number three is kind of the north end there. That's basically from Hendricks North. But um, we're talking about two tributary areas, one to Mason Run and one to the Ives Drain. Uh, you can't see it real well, but the top blue line um, running kind of left to right and diagonally is the Mason Run Drain. There we go. Hey, did you do that? Yeah. Okay, because I thought I clicked something and I was afraid I had done it. Um, <laughs> no Patrick. Thank you very much. Go ahead. I, I, that's fine. I, I, I don't really need the power. <laughs> um, the, the top blue line there is a Mason Run drain uh, as it traverses the site. It's actually cut off west of the railroad tracks. Um, those are both dedicated county drains. Uh, as and that, that legal process was cleaned up in the last uh, clean out of Mason Run, which is four or five years ago. Uh, the yellow and the uh, teal lines on there are kind of the individual storm sewers in the neighborhood, which is consists of um, John L., Rosler, McCormick, Lavender, um, and then farther south you get into uh, Toll Street. Uh, Hendricks goes east and west there. And then the southerly blue line kind of just going out to the right hand, uh, right lower right is the Ives Drain. That's quite a bit smaller cross section of an open ditch, uh, but it also has a smaller tributary area. And Ives uh, essentially goes together with Mason Run east of Michigan Avenue. So those two systems do eventually come together. Uh, what we're we're looking at is a, uh, and I'll, if you want to zoom back out, Michelle, great, thank you. Um, and so as I mentioned, pretty much for the most part, everything from around Hendricks uh, and just a little bit south of there drains north to Mason Run. Everything south drains to Ives within that pink boundary. Um, we, we've mentioned this before, we're kind of on borrowed time, knock on wood. We haven't, it's been a few years since we've had a major event up there, but we have had some uh, 
large scale flooding events um, in past years. Um, we funded a concept study back in 2015 that's sort of uh, laid dormant for a little while here um, for a comprehensive project development. Um, Spicer Group returned with their recommendations and uh, we also, I also mentioned here that we're coming up on the time of year when I select our street programs and we do have at least uh, two streets in the area that are very, very strong candidates for reconstruction and those would be John L. and Toll Street. So both of those have been in the queue for a number of years and we should start looking at those. Uh, which means, we, in keeping with the philosophy Mr. Leroy and I have entertained over the years, we don't want to put in a street project and then turn around and tear it back up again. So uh, some of the challenges, which I've mentioned before, and I'll just hit on again, uh, the, the land actually flows from sort of south to north, or from north to south, I mean, whereas the storm sewers run from south to north. So what it means is you get farther and farther south away from Mason Run, you want the storm sewers going towards Mason Run, but... Um, they get shallower and shallower. So that's one of the challenges that we face is getting the right sized storm. That's Mason Run right there. Um, so you can see it's not terribly deep. Um, it's really flat in the area, so that doesn't help overland flow. That's why you get a lot of ponding in backyards. You get a lot of, uh, when you do have a storm in the roads, it doesn't go very fast. Um, and some roadways lack storm entirely. So you've got John L. and McCormick that don't have storm sewers on them at all. So people that want to connect their sump pumps and their footer tiles don't have a place to put them. Um, the other roadways we believe have some pretty, uh, I don't want to say dramatically undersized, but they're, they're undersized from what the current design would be. Uh, I already mentioned poor rear yard drainage, lack of outlets. Um, we think, Mr. Leroy and I have uh, done some review, we think between 75 and 80% of the homes of the roughly 250 homes in this target area have uh, clear water discharges to sanitary sewers. And what that means is you've either got a footer tile, a roof leader, or a sump pump, or all of the above, that tie into the sanitary sewer. And where that gets into problems is you've got sanitary sewers then that can surcharge. And in a lot of these cases, we also have the worst of the worlds in that we have a lot of tri-levels in this neighborhood. So those living spaces actually have the floor drains that are tied into the sanitary sewer. So when you get surcharges, a lot of those start to fill up in basements. And those basements are, I'll call them high value. So. Uh, we kind of have the worst of all worlds in this in this subdivision. Uh, here's some example photos I show you. This is the, these are the last couple of runs, and again, I know you've all seen this before, but I want to stress it again. The the couple of pictures that's actually where the storm sewer from Lavender comes into the Mason Run drain itself. You can see all that mud in the bottom, and that's because the last foot to get the storm sewer depth we need, the last foot goes backwards. So you actually come uphill by a foot to get to the bottom of the Mason Run drain, which means it's a constant maintenance headache. And so that further restricts the capacity of those lines. I'll give you a bunch of numbers. I won't sp spend too much time on them. But basically, the, the, the surface elevation at the south end of McCormick is about, 500 and, uh, about 592 feet, or the uh, 600 feet above sea level. And the bottom of the Mason Run drains about 592. Uh, I, I'm sorry. The, the, the top surface at Mason Run is about 600. The bottom of the drain is about 592. Uh, the southern end of the basin is about 596, so that means that you're only four feet above the bottom of the drain at the south end of McCormick that's a quarter mile away. So, again, a lot of problems there. Um, I mentioned in here as we're getting into the residents, we need to lay, the, in order to proceed with this project, we need to lay the new tributary storm sewers, um, and residents still have to connect to those in order to receive some benefits. So the, the challenge is the lines we would have to lay, the new ones would be too shallow, and they might be too small. So uh, we're looking at what we have to do comprehensively for the entire neighborhood to try to remedy just trying to piecemeal this in there. So the Spicer Group report they did in 2015, which we then subsequently modified to add from a 10-year design to a 25-year design to get a couple options, uh, determined we'd need detention, likely some kind of a backup system in the James and Hendricks Park. And what that would do is basically equalize the flow so that if you had our lines get full, then it would actually spill backwards into the park. Uh, because as again, as I mentioned, where we have the storage is not where is sort of the upstream end of the basin. Um, they recommend addition to new lines on McCormick and John L to provide each house to connect uh, a place to connect. And as I mentioned here, the current system is only designed for about two year storm or less in some segments without starting to flood. Um, the original 10 year des detention design, these are in 2015 dollars, result still in some street and rear yard nuisance flooding, but it actually it provides for all of the size lines that you need for sump pump discharges in a 10-year storm would be about 700,000 shade under that. Um, that was again in 2015 dollars and we know what construction inflation's done the last few years. 
Sizing up to a 25-year design would basically require us to upsize every pipe we've got in the ground. Um, detention at both James and Hendricks Park, and it actually talked about a, a detention basin that showed on the SSIHM property for Ives Drain. Uh, there's actually an alternate that we've got a city park over there. I don't know if that would be a palatable alternative. Um, but that project cost about one, $1. million in 2015 dollars. Oh, I forgot to put a photo of the Toll Street in here. Sorry about that. That was Pat Lewis not remembering to do something on a Tuesday morning. Um, here's some... It right there, though. It goes right there. <laughs> when I get it, the photo will go right there. Um, boy, it's been a long day. Uh, uh, the, so we've got some roadway needs here. Uh, and so as I mentioned, those it's not just Toll and John L. I'm going to never live this one down. Um, Toll and John L. are the ones that I would say are at the top of our needs list. And um, for those of you that have driven toll, it's been kind of a mess for the last four or five years. We've spray patched it. John L. is a, is a ticking time bomb. That's When that falls apart, that's got hairline cracks that are every couple of inches. Um, but then we've also got some other segments in the, in the area that aren't long for this world either. Lavender between McCormick and Mason Run Drain has curbs that are in pretty poor shape and these edge of the road starting to fall off. McCormick's okay, um, but then we've got a short segment of Lorraine and Calkins that are both in pretty poor shape. We would actually do those with toll because they're concrete. Every single street above there has a surface that's at least 25 years old, and some, are, some of them are actually original. Toll would be one of the original ones, over 40 years old. So uh, we certainly wouldn't be wasting money if we rebuilt all of the above roadways. However, as we mentioned before, we should not undertake any street work until a determination is made on the storm sewer. So we need to review the sizing for adequacy before we go forward with the project. That box in the middle was supposed to have been deleted, so. I... <sighs> okay. Okay. Stop beating okay. myself up here. No, you're okay. Uh, you, again, you can see the, uh, you can see most of the pink line. That's actually the sanitary system boundary, um, which is slightly different than the storm system boundary. Uh, again, sanitary sewers flow to the north and go to the 18-inch system that's in the bottom of Mason Run Drain. So the boundaries more or less overlap. The wastewater department's operating under a cor corrective action plan, and the draft of that actually includes a footing disconnect program where it makes financial sense to do that. Um, this is an area where it clearly makes financial sense as the most uh, cost-effective way to remove that uh, the, the clear water discharges. Uh, we mentioned before the sanitary sur service area includes 247 homes. We estimate 180 to 190 have clear water connected. Um, you can't see the number underneath there, but we exceed the ex expected sanitary residential flow by about 50,000 gallons per day. And that works out to about 300 gallons per home per day that we exceed that. So that's, that's coming from clear water discharges. Uh, so we need to implement an area-wide footing drain disconnection program in conjunction with this storm sewer work for this to be truly effective for uh, long term. I mean, we need to solve this the right way. If we're going to do this, let's do this right. Uh, there's the corrective action plan, which I can either read to you or uh, you can just look at that. But basically, it requires us under our permit, our, our uh, MDEQ or our EGLE, I think they're calling it now, permit. The permittee shall complete, complete a corrective action plan to eliminate secondary treatment bypasses. And that's basically where you get your overflows due to clear water. Uh, we've got the discharge event, 25-year, 24-hour event during the growth season. So uh, essentially what this means, the city needs to undertake significant efforts to minimize clear water discharges from the sanitary collection system to the extent feasible. So in other words, this is an opportunity we have because we've got so many in a critical area all together that we can get the biggest bang by removing those. So what that means is Mr. Pastu referred to, we're talking about some kind of foot or drain disconnection program. I've got these graphics courtesy of Mr. Leroy that show sort of a before and after of what such a program might look like. But basically, essentially, routes, routes any, any footer tiles, anything from the outside into a sump pump, which can then be uh, basically raised up through a pump and discharged to a storm sewer. Why we can't do this now, and some residents can, but the, the, those that lack a storm sewer on their own uh, frontage can't do it. They don't have anything to, to tie into it. They don't have a public main available to them. So that's why construction of new sewers is important as a part of this project. So where are we now? And uh, we've, we've got that, uh, obtained that proposal from Spicer Group, and we did decide we would like to work with them because they performed the conceptual work, and this is right up their alley. They've done uh, many of the county drain projects in the area for uh, the drain commissioner's office. So we think they're the logical choice to proceed with the next phase here. 
this does not include final design, but it, right now we only got the area north of Hendricks, and we should expand that to the south to include the Ives watershed. So we'll be getting a, an amendment to that proposal. Um, I plan to present that to the city council in two weeks. Uh, they listed a first phase of 78,000. Um, and again, that number will go up because we want to add the Ives area in there. But that includes basically everything up to, but not including construction plans. Um, so those will be, uh, we want to get, we want to get this in front of us because we need, before we do detailed design and everything, we need to get signs, sign offs on the different concept levels. Um, so we, but we do also need a comprehensive investigation by staff, whether that's a combination of staff and our consultant, just staff, staff and our wastewater consultant. But we've got to find out how many of these homes have sump pumps, where they go, how many have footer tiles, so that we have an idea of what the private side is going to look like. Um, so we can't really determine a total project cost until we get the scope of the problem known. I, I throw up there some funding uh, sources with the understanding that we do not have any proportion set aside yet. Uh, we do have capital improvements funding that will be sufficient to all, include all the design work and then some. So from the for the time being, that will come from the general fund. And that was already allocated. I believe we had some personal property taxes that we were uh, setting aside for that. So that's already been budgeted. Um, but the, as we know, this is going to exceed the $400 or so thousand dollar budget that we have in there. Um, so we've got potential local street funds, certainly for the road res resurfacing and reconstruction. Um, storm sewer on those roads is eligible from the street funds as well. Wastewater fund would be looking to contribute to this because it's, it's clear water discharges that are required to eliminate by their con uh, corrective action plan. Um, there's obviously more general fund money you could put there and any property owner assessments that you wish to consider. It doesn't mean we have to, but that's, that's a, a possible source. Step, as I mentioned, we set aside funding through the 1920 CIP. Um, I'd like to work with Spicer Group. Recommend award likely in two weeks, provided I can get the amendment to the proposal. And wastewater and engineering staff to begin going house to house to assess the situation in the project area. Um, probably at this point, we're not looking at, at a construction until 2021. Um, but some streets, uh, Toll and John L., those are ones we would like to do. Uh, toll more than John L. really in 2020. Um, we're, I'm still hoping we can find a way because that one's just one link that if we can determine what size that needs to be We could still probably get toll street in next year's program um, but then understanding needs to be brought forth that we Again may be bypassing two of our worst streets in favor of some other ones this year because we've got to get this done Right, we don't want to have to come back through and decide whoops We got to enlarge the storm sewer by another foot in diameter So uh, if we can get a deter determination what toll street needs to be on storm sewer um, then we, we will probably try to get that in the 2020 construction because they've been waiting a long time and that's absolutely one of our worst streets in town. So I'll leave it at that because that's all I had in my presentation. Um, but I don't know if Mr. Pastu has any additional information. You know, I'm just going to reiterate a few things. Uh, but clearly one of the things as we talked about last fall was we had that uncertainty with the personal property tax reimbursement as the statute last year was amended. We got a much better handle. I think we were getting about 650 additional last year and then this year it's going to come in around 450 but at least we have a number to go forward and and some of this may take place in phases as certainly mr lewis indicated uh, with maybe toll street if uh, we can do that the right way but but the intent is we've got to you know look long term 40 50 years with a lot of these infrastructure projects let's get them done the right way and clearly uh, one of the things i uh, I at first didn't pay attention to with uh, talking with uh, Mr. Lewis and Leroy was actually the design uh, estimate included uh, everything being the footing disconnect as to what the uh, storm uh, sewer uh, capacity would be. So I, I'm comfortable going forward with that. Uh, uh, but the other thing with it is, is that it would have leads uh, for the individual property owners uh, going back to the one uh, illustration there that uh, if the footing uh, drain is disconnected and uh, you know sumps installed and pumped to the uh, to the lead there it'll go into the storm sewer system as opposed to the sanitary line um, but the sanitary sewer disconnect is it's uh, having been a part of this project in the past is not an easy project to, to undertake uh, it's going to require a lot of uh, uh, engagement with property owners uh, and uh, and clearly, it's something that, uh, you know, we need to consider, certainly for the uh, corrective action plan, but uh, the fact that it does uh, affect uh, water, wastewater plant efficiency. And so we'll be coming back with some more details regarding how that uh, 
plan and program will work because uh, there's a lot of uh, suspicion and uncertainty with it. I'm at a point where from a, from a manager standpoint that, you know, the storm sewer is and the road work, you know, need to go hand in hand. I'm probably not looking at a, uh, uh, a special assessment uh, related to this type of work. I just feel we just have to take care of the infrastructure deficiency, both stormwater and, and road and, and do that with the city resources. But the sanitary sewer disconnect, I'm contemplating something where if you're not willing to participate, then we're gonna consider levying a surcharge because you are putting extra water, uh, clear water into the wastewater system for treatment. Um, you know, there is, uh, you know, we tried to figure out from a staff standpoint, what's the best carrot and stick and to what magnitude, but, but I do think that uh, we need to contemplate uh, if, and there's gonna be some residents that are gonna be unwilling to participate in, and I think once we start that process, there may have to be some mechanism where they're surcharged for their contribution to the sanitary system by refusing to, to connect uh, or disconnect uh, their, their uh, footing drains and other uh, to the sanitary system. But uh, again, I think we proceed forward with it with a higher design standard to do it the right way so that long term we're not revisiting these problems on an ongoing basis. So. Well, uh, uh, Michelle, we'll start there, and then we'll, I probably have some comments too. Good. So, from the home line to the street, the resident pays for that, or we're paying for that, or does it? Uh, we the, don't know yet. The uh, I think what Mr. Pastu and and we kind of came up with is that the, the the initial phase would we the city would be putting in all the whatever increased size new lines whatever needs to be and the taps to the right-of-way line that'll be the first phase the second phase will be coordinate with the property owners to make that connection of their clear water to the tap we gave them at the property line and provided that they cooperate as they need to so we can get that out of the sanitary collection there would not be a cost to the property owners that's and again the council is free to do what they want down the road with this but that's what we had contemplated but where it comes in is if they refuse to participate, as some do, that's when we would have to consider either a surcharge or some other type of assessment mechanism, whatever is determined. And how would you police that? Well, we'll know who's not, and part of this, the, the first process is to do additional testing of uh, property owners uh, to uh, determine, you know, where the, uh, you know, some of the eaves are connected. They do some, you know, smoke testing uh, on different things, and I think, of the 250, roughly, we talked about maybe 180, 190 are disconnected to, to, to the sanitary. So we got more further investigation to do with this. But uh, uh, at some point, we may have to, you know, start uh, taking some financial uh, incentives or, you know, uh, means to, to try and compel participation because it does add a lot of cost to the to the wastewater system to pre treat that uh, uh, additional. Uh, clear water and the, the other thing to, to add to the discussion too is that i mean ultimately this project is designed to protect the homeowners as well from, yes. from their basements flooding so i mean i would i would expect the vast majority of the of the residents would want to see a comprehensive solution so that we don't have to go through the scene we did five years ago where the contents of someone's entire basement was out the street for curb for trash collection because it was all wet okay. and so i think there's that, that part needs to be stressed that it's not just to get the water out of the sanitary collection. It is, but that water then cycles right back through those floor drains. So providing some kind of backwater valve as well as removing the source of that backup, though, that two-pronged attack is what we're, what we're looking to do. Sure. Uh, John? And what's the design? Is it a 25-year rain event? I think we would like to try to design a 25-year rain event because realistically at this point, if we're, if we're looking at the whole neighborhood and doing a comprehensive tear-up, I don't think the incremental cost is going to end up being that big of a difference. I think in either case you're going to need a pond. I think you're going to need to make some major improvements on your trunk system. So I think in the end it would make sense to do this do this to the standard that we really should have. And that's and if this were a new subdivision, for example, Glenridge at the Country Club was the most recent subdivision we had, that was a requirement from the drain commissioner's office um, into toll gate drain, is that they had to meet a 25-year design standard. And that included rear yard lines. Uh, just for comparison, you've got streets here that have 15-inch storm sewers serving the entire street. Glenridge, you have 12-inch rear yard lines only. 
those just pick up the back two backyards, 12 inch lines coming off the main trunk. So that's a difference of scope of what we're talking here. It's, it's significant, um, but we think it's, it's the way it should be done. So we're talking two ponds or one? You could be talking two ponds because Ives and Mason Run have separate drainage areas. And uh, unless we're going to consider something that brings all of the Ives tributary area back north to Mason Run, which is further compounded by the, the gradient going the wrong way, you'd be looking at a pond for the Ives tributary area and probably one for Mason Run, which might be a backup system. That's part of the value engineering that goes into the you know, looking at the comprehensive system, though, as to what's the most effective way to, to look at yeah. that. I mean, the, an alternative we had talked about, too, which I don't really like because it would add continual maintenance, is maybe you end up having to deepen the storm sewers to where they should be into, like, a, a, a deep pond with a pump station in, say, Calgary Park. I mean, that would be an option that was we've conceptually looked at, but again, you've got a pump station that's going to run fairly often. It seems counterintuitive. You've got a pump station on the upstream ends, of, you know, a detention pond at the upstream end of the Mason Run since it's cut off at the tracks, but it's, this is a strange situation. So we're going to look at all those types of options with Spicer, and that's why we've, that's why we've got kind of a number of iterations built into their proposal. Well, from an engineering perspective, it can be done. Yes. The Romans built aqueducts where the water flow uphill. So I think in today's world, we probably can do it. But I think the, the, the bigger concern I have is when you're talking about putting, redoing all of the streets, because they're in, you know, they're 20, 30, 40 years old, and we're talking about putting in storm drains, and we're talking about putting in ponds, why don't we just do it, why don't we put in the storm drains deeper? If we're going to have everything torn up, why don't we just go down deeper? That's, that's why I brought up the idea of, of a stormwater pump station. That may prove to be the, the better solution, but that wasn't what Spicer modeled in their initial report, so I don't want to say that yet until we've had a chance to, to look at that. And then the other thing is the ponds, uh, the design of the ponds. I mean, this is, this is conceptual, but the design of the ponds, based on where they're going to be at in a residential neighborhood, shouldn't look like engineered re retention or detention facilities, right. they should look like ponds that are public, that are part of the public amenity. Stocked with fish, potentially, well, if they're going to be but, wet. you know, look yeah. like they're part of the subdivision. But the other thing in terms of financing, aren't we at a point where every time we do capital improvements, some of the streets, like, for example, I'll just bring it up because a gentleman brought it up two weeks ago. Yeah. He said, you know, Harrison Street is, the condition is terrible. But because we have low volumes, we never rise to the top. I can see it kind of like it's Groundhog Day. Every time we do this, some of the streets that really need to get done are not getting done because there's always a higher priority somewhere else. And I've talked to the city manager about it conceptually. Are we at a point, and this is really for the manager, are we at a point where we need to really start thinking about neighborhood improvement districts where different neighborhoods contribute along with us in terms of more rapid installation of infrastructure than waiting on a 20, 30, or 40 year cycle? I'll, I'll field part of that question actually, um, which is, goes back to when in 2006 I did a street report. Uh, we were preparing to potentially go out for a street millage in 2006. And I had done a comprehensive survey of other communities in the state. And I know one community actually did that. They did a they would move streets, I think it was Jackson at the time, would, would actually move streets up the list if the, if the residents paid, it was like a 50% special assessment on it. They had their order and they said, this is where we think you're going to be. Obviously, that's in flux based on the amount of funding we get from the state, construction, inflation, all those things. But they gave an estimate um, and they said, but if the residents kick in 50%, you'll get done next year. And I think it was the next year. So that's, I don't know about the neighbor, neighborhood improvement, um, how that functionally would work. I think that is a question for the city manager. I haven't really looked into that uh, financing. I assume that's be like some kind of a TIF district almost. Kind of. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, it's more of like a, it's more of a, of a neighborhood wide special assessment, a, a special district. assessment district where the costs are spread out along amongst yeah. more properties than just like a street. It'd be like an entire neighborhood. Well, and admittedly, I think early on years ago, I think this was even before Mr. Pastu was here, I think that was one thing we were looking at for this neighborhood. But, you know, this neighborhood's got, has, when it went in initially, it went in with some significant engineering issues. Yes. It, it's got soil issues. Uh, storms weren't put in the right way. Yeah, and, uh, and even the rear yard lines that they have, yeah. some of them are afterthoughts. 
they weren't built until after the developer put the homes in and started realizing they had gullies back there, and then they put in these six-inch underdrain, basically, things that don't really do a whole lot. So we have an op- I guess where I'm getting at, Your Honor, we have an opportunity, if we take a broader picture, we could really take that area, which is a nice neighborhood now, and make it a lot better for people that won't have to worry about stormwater and sanitary issues and street problems. Well, I will tell so, you, going to your uh, uh, question about uh, neighborhood improvement, uh, we are, you know, staff-wise, going to, to start looking uh, from a capital improvements uh, through the Citizens Planning Commission, a pretty comprehensive, much longer term uh, approach. And some of it's going to have to deal with funding. I, will, I think we all agree what we are able to contribute to local streets is, and residential streets is woefully inadequate. And we just got to come up with a solution. We know the state of Michigan uh, continues to, to cut funding, uh, you know, for, for work. And, and even some of the proposed tax increase uh, would not do anything for local units. So we're on our own. A lot of other communities have done taken other actions to address the condition and problem of residential streets. And so we're there. And, and so I, I can tell you at the staff end of it, we're starting this process in earnest uh, in two weeks, actually. So... So as I think this through, because I know this isn't new about this uh, St. Mary's Gardens, and I, I, I think the comments were well made, you know, it was built and it was deficient in certain fashions, at least for today, and it's been challenging over uh, the past decade or so. At the same time, looking at trying to find funding from the partnership with the community, I think that's a good idea, but at the same time, it can't be to the disadvantage of those that can't support right. the funding, because then what you have is the same ones that, one of the couple of streets were already mentioned, definitely a, a different uh, a level of opportunity to participate by the residents that reside there, whether they be owned or then, of course, not owned becomes if they're rentals. And, of course, getting those owners to participate may be, I, I want to say they're going to be less likely because I don't know, but it's just going to be those considerations. So I think conceptually I like the, the thought and discussion, but I don't want it to be the, the disadvantage of others that may not have the ability to do so. And a couple of streets do get bypassed and have been. And it's a really a balance, I think, as we look at this. So we, I think we can clearly see the need within the St. Mary's Gardens and the, all the reasons stated and how do we move forward with that and still not let others deteriorate more. Maybe they're deteriorating more, therefore they become less attractive neighborhoods, and we need to uplift those as well. So just my comment as we move forward to balance that discussion. But I agree there's opportunities to maybe um, – in, in one area, but the others, knowing that it may not be, that we, we have to make the commitment because our, our obligation as well to, to fix and repair and make that neighborhood equally um, beneficial. So, And I would add too, add too that the adequate drainage has an impact on the street itself. So sure. if we don't solve the drainage issues, we're going to end up with the streets deteriorating at a quicker rate too. So I, I didn't and we, really And the disconnect, that. we've had that before through a litigation and we just cannot go back there. And even when we tell asking people the opportunity to do that and then they, and it doesn't, it still comes back to us. They'll say they want different design and wants the city to pay for it. But that's where I think the participation should, uh, and I agree with the, if they're not unwilling to participate, then it is, uh, I'll say, taxing the system at the other end, and we need to make sure that that's accounted for because that's costing. It's costing us at, at both ends, costing the customer, and we need to balance, uh, make sure that gets resolved. Uh, Andrew, you had a comment. Thank you, sir. Um, are the properties backing up to the Mason Run drain assessed for any drain improvements? Uh, they are at present. Uh, pretty much, I would say two-thirds to three-quarters of the north side of the river paid an assessment when Mason Run drain was clear, cleaned out. Mm -hmm. Uh, the drain commissioner's office kept that to like a flat rate. They, they typically assess by acreage, um, but for urban developed lots, they didn't do any differentiation between a quarter acre or a third of an acre. It was mostly just the same lot. So it was, up, it was around, I think, $500, and they might have had three years to spread it over. Okay. And um, can you go back to one of the pictures you had uh, showing the back of the house in its proximity to the drain? And is that usual right there? So that's not much room between the house and the drain itself. Uh, that no, that's usual not usual. Room? That's probably the closest house. This is just, uh, at Lavender Street. That's the house just south of the drain. Um, that's not the, well, I can't say it's the only place that it's that close. Okay. The, the drain commissioner's office has legally a 99-foot easement centered on the physical location of the center of the drain. Right. I'm pretty positive the edge of that house is not 49 and a half feet from the center of the drain. But. And why I'm bringing that up is because I know that the drain commissioner's office is now um, looking at more uh, 
uh, incentive programs for buffer strips being put in adjacent mm-hmm. to the drains. And if the property owners would then be uh, willing to put in a buffer strip um, or maintain one, maybe that would be some um, incentive or alleviation on their part for the next improvements to the drain. And it would also alleviate some of the, the water retention and drainage problems that we have. And I'm looking how fortunate that our first council action item is an amendment to the weed ordinance that is specifically going to make rain gardens like that uh, more available to, to residents in the community to retain uh, uh, water and reduce runoff. I, I won't say that any of that's not possible. Um, I, I think they were more concerned about the agricultural runoff from the larger parcels. Um, I'm, I'm sure they were. That I'm was, trying that, to use that program to yeah. benefit the, the residents of the city of Monroe. Well, the good news is I don't anticipate another clean out of Mason Run coming for quite a while. No, so probably hopefully there won't not. be any other assessments. But yeah, the residents are paying, of this neighborhood as well, are paying an assessment for like around the $500 range for, uh, they probably have paid it off already because I think that was enough years ago. I think with three years to pay, it's... It's already paid off now, but something to explore. It is 716. We need to wrap it up, see if there's anything further. I'll ask Mr. Pastu if there's any comments or additional and timelines. Okay. Anything further from council? We conclude the work session before we get ready for the council meeting. Seeing nothing further at this point. Close the uh, City Council work session and we'll uh, reconvene in about 14 minutes. Thank you.